So, uh, the new story. I'm engaged to get married. So, uh, it's a weird thing, especially at 62 years of age. No male in my family has lived past 65. So, she's going to get a good three years out of me. I've almost died like three times in the last 10 years. And I've been in the hospital four times in the last six months. So, she's going to get a lot of money real quick. <laughs> Having said that, though, it brought something to my mind. It's very interesting. You would think that all the different things that happened to me where I've been sick or almost dead or killed and all these things have happened in the last many years, even more recently, a lot in the last six months, would make me think. You know, you would think about stuff and go, what's the meaning of life? It didn't. But getting married is the weirdest thing in the world. You guys just did it. When you're young, you do it, and you don't even think about it, right? You go, ah, let's just get married, and we'll go fight the world together. But what happens when you get married, and you've already fought the world, and you've won? You go, okay, now what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And all of a sudden, for the first time, really ever, because when I first got married, I was like 19 years old, and had no idea, you know what I mean? Didn't have two dimes rubbed together. But now I'm sitting here going, what are we going to do? Now you have to think in parts of two. Does that make sense? It's the weirdest thing. I haven't had to think as a part of something for 50 years. Whatever, 20 to 60, whatever that would be, 40. Whatever it is. It's weird. Do you feel that? Do you feel like you have to make decisions with your spouse? Do you? Now, I've told people for years, that's the dumbest thing in the world. If you can't make a decision without your spouse, you're a wimp, right? Right? My favorite saying used to be, take your right hand, stick it between your legs. If there's anything there, take your left hand and sign this contract, and let's get going. Because you don't need to go home and ask your wife if you've got any. Honey, can I have mine today? Can I take them with me? Right? Can I have the spare even? But now I have to think like two. It's a weird deal. So you start thinking about weird things like prenuptial agreements and wills and how much money you're going to leave to each kid. And you're like, why do I have to plan all this? Why can't I just die in peace? But now I have to know what's going to happen after I die. I've never wanted to know what happens after I die. But I started thinking about it. it's a commitment. Marriage is a commitment, but now what you're doing is you're committing to these other people, the person you're marrying, the kids, all these people, you're committing. And so this, this week I did some radio shows about commitment, and it really sort of struck me that we make so many commitments in our life that are ridiculous, and we think nothing of them. Yet we could make great commitments and have them get it, become accomplished. I was just sitting eating with somebody just a minute ago before I got here, and he brought up a good point. He goes, Dale, you've got thousands of stories. You've done hundreds of things. It's all really exciting. Your life's been incredible. I go, because I've set out to do what I want to do every time and got everything I've ever wanted and did everything I ever wanted to do. So why doesn't everybody do that? Why do you stay at the same job that you're not happy with, that isn't making you rich, for the rest of your life? Why do you say in a marriage that doesn't work? Why do we do these things? And so I started thinking about commitments. And people talk us into commitments. I have one I want you to think about tonight. How many of you have committed to send your kids to college? Anybody? Some of you are old. You said, I've already got them out of there. <laughs> right? I got through that. So here's a commitment. I'm going to commit to my kids that I'm going to get them a college education, spend $50,000, $250,000, whatever it costs to get them a college education, so that they can get a job and work for the rest of their life. Wow. I know when you took that commitment on, it seemed really, really smart and really important. But by 34 years of age, I was a retired millionaire. I didn't think it was all that smart to tell my daughter she had to go to college. 
I said, look, let me just leave you 10 or 20 million, and I think you'll get, a, you'll get along okay. Right now, she's training for Miss Olympia. She went in her first bodybuilding contest, won her first bodybuilding contest. Now she wants to be Miss Olympia. Has nothing to do with making any money. She'll never make a dime doing that. But she didn't have to. Why? Because you could make a slightly different commitment. How about a commitment to say, I'm going to go out and buy enough real estate that there'll be enough passive income to put my kid through college? I'm going to take the same money and the same commitment that I, I committed to getting my kid through college. I'm going to take that money and committing to producing passive streams of income. I didn't have time for anything. I was always busy working, trying to get my kid through college. But instead, I, instead of spending all my money and time on that commitment, I created the commitment to create the passive income. Now, when they go to college, there's going to be enough income there to pay for them to go to college. But what's different is, when they're done, there's enough income there for me to retire. If you think about how slightly different that sentence is, I commit to putting my kids through college, or I commit to putting my kids through college with passive income, two words different but it's a lifetime of differences in the quality of your children and your own life. Those are the kinds of commitments. And so I'm sitting there going now, man, if I get married, I'm now going to have to convince somebody else to do the right thing, to do the smart thing. Do you understand? And I had a guy write me an email today. He said, Dell, could you tell my wife something for me? He says, you know wives never listen to husbands. And I said, dude, not only do I know that, I wrote a rule about it in the book of life. So if you go to the book of life, you'll find rule 1437B-7, which says, no one will ever believe a thing you said once they've seen you without your clothes on. More commonly, it's known as familiarity breeds contempt. Nobody listens to people close to them. And so I'm trying to think, man, how do I do this? How do I get things done? And I have to work through all that. You guys have all had to work through that. But the bottom line is this. How many commitments have you made in your life? You committed to go through college and to make it. I'm going to graduate from college. You did it. It was a commitment. It worked. But it didn't do anything. It got you a job. And that's it. So if you can make a crazy commitment like, I'm going to pay off my house. Anybody here got a paid in full house? How much did that house pay you last month? Okay, but I'm just asking you, how much did the house pay you? Paid in full house. What does it pay you? Nothing. How many people have a paid in full house? Come on, be honest. What did it pay you last month? You've got all this money. This is together. We're married. Hey, honey, we've got this money. We could go out with that two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar home that we have, whatever it is, five hundred thousand, whatever it is, and we could buy an apartment complex. We could make ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars a month for the rest of our lives, and it could pay the mortgage on the house. And we could have a new house anytime we want because it just keep paying. And we'd be rich. But no, we gotta pay off the house. It's a commitment. Where did we get that commitment? I'm not asking you, I don't want to embarrass you, but you got it from somebody. It was one of your parents. One of you is the charger in the family is going, this is what we're going to do. Because my parents said it's the right thing to do. Now, are your parents worth 75 million bucks? Probably not. Could they be worth 75 million? Should be. Could be. But you know why they're not? Because they committed to a paid in full house. Anybody got a 401k? Anybody? And what did it pay you last month? Uh, that would be nothing. What's worse than nothing, though? There is something worse than nothing. You had to pay it. Can you believe that? You've got an investment you have to pay every month. It's demanding of you. And it doesn't pay you a thing. 
for those of you who are new in here, I want you to think about this. This is, this is the real estate investment I think you all should think about. Let's go buy you a house and let's not rent it. And let's pay mortgage payments on it for 30 years. Because after 30 years, it's got to be worth more than what it started out as, right? It's going to go up in value, right? Who cares that you have to pay into it every single month for 30 years? It's going to be worth more someday, right? Kind of sounds like a 401k. I'm going to pay into it for 30 years. And someday, someday it's going to be worth more, except if I retire in 2008. The recession hits, and the house and my 401k are worth half of what they were six months ago. Would you take on that real estate investment that I just told you about? You would say, boy, that's really a dumb thing. I don't know why we're even here. Because it's stupid. It's dumb as a rock. Yet, probably a very good percentage of you in this room have a 401k, which to me is dumb as a rock. I want something that pays me money. When I buy something, when I buy an asset, I only buy an asset that pays me. I don't pay it, it pays me, or I don't buy it. What about gold? I once was doing a seminar in front of 500 people with Fox News experts with me there on the panel. And they go, gold, gold's where you need to be, inflation. I said, gold is a rock. That's all it is, it's a rock. It's useless. Some of you like dirt. You buy dirt. I got a lot somewhere. I bought a lot. We're going to retire on it someday. But you're never going to retire because you're never going to have any money. And the reason I know you're not going to have any money is because you're stupid enough to buy a lot, (laughs) which pays you no money. How can you get rich if nothing is paying you money? Your 401k is not paying you. Your IRA is not paying you. That lot you're going to retire on is not paying you. Your paid in full home is not paying you. Nothing you own is paying you money. How are you ever going to get rich? And how are you ever going to retire? I don't see it. It just doesn't work. So let's make some different commitments this year. I was uh, sitting here today in a meeting. and I've been out sick, like I said. And there was a guy who came in and he was talking. And all of a sudden, we realize we're looking around, they're going, why are there so many people in this room that are rich? So many people in this room that are retired. How can you get that many rich and retired people together in the same room? And they said, why did you do all this? Why did you create this? And I thought about it, and I came up with my pat answer that people don't like to hear, is that when I was retired at 34 years of age, I had nothing and nobody to do anything with. Everybody I knew had to get up and go to work every day. I had no friends. I had nobody to hang around with. So I had to create a situation where I taught people to become rich so that I had friends to play with that didn't have to get up and go to work every day. Sound good. You guys ready to go? Tonight we're going to have some people here to share their experiences with you. The reason we have case studies for the last 29 years is that I figured out very quickly when I started Lifestyles 29 and a half years ago that you really don't care what I have or what I've done. You go, yeah, of course you did. Doesn't mean anything. You're, You're special. You're different. You're a freak. You're whatever. You got lucky. Whatever whatever it is you want to believe is why I have what I have. And I realized the only way I could get new people to actually believe any of this stuff was to bring up people that were newly successful and have them speak. Because then you can see somebody that looks just like you. Go, boy, they look like us. They got the same story as us. They've got kids like we do. You know, they live the same way we live, same kind of job. And you can put two to two together and go, wow, it must be real. Either that or he's paying these people to get up there and say this stuff. 
But if you come back month after month after month and it's different people every month, you'll realize that what's really happened is, is that the phenomenon has developed here where people help other people become successful. And then we pay it forward. So if, how many people are new here tonight? Let me see your hands. A lot of new people. Good. Let me show you what lifestyles is all about. There is a concept out there. I think it was uh, created by Stephen Covey, Seven Habits, Highly Effective People. I think it's where the concept came from. Where he talks about people as they get older don't really grow up. They don't really mature. They just get older. And so you got a lot of old people out there that are really just as dumb as they were when they were kids. And if you look at that, you find that these people are dependent. They're dependent on what? What are you dependent on? Most of you? A job, right? You're either dependent on the government giving you money or you're dependent on your job giving you money. Most of you. Not the other people here, they're already succeeding, becoming financially free. So goal number one was instead of moving up the ladder, which means going from 10,000 a year to 50,000 to, to 100 to 200,000, our whole lives we tried to climb the ladder. Does that make sense? We look at success as making a little bit more money than we made last year or the year before or whatever. That's, we're more successful. Does that make sense? That's been our goal. But we've never had the goal to get out from underneath of being dependent. And if you want to think about it in the quality of life, if you're standing on a ladder and there's someone above you in any business you're in and you're looking at this person above you in life, one thing you have to realize is the view never changes. It's always the same. And the other thing you need to realize about the ladder is shit always falls downhill. Right? The guy at the bottom is going to get squished. The guy at the top is going to get okay. They're going to be okay. So your goal was to try to get as high on the ladder as you can so less shit came down and hit you in the head every day. That was your goal. We have a different goal for you. We want you to become independent. Now, we're going to call this a job. And we're going to talk about being self-employed. When you're self-employed, there's still a ladder that is about how much money you make. Right? And you go out there and determine how hard you're willing to work to make a certain amount of money. But there's two things that are different. There's no one above you giving you crap every day. Right? And there's no one blocking your way up the ladder. Some of you would be happy with $10,000 a month. I was talking to people just a minute ago. We were out to dinner. And the guy says, what is the biggest thing you find wrong with helping people for the last 30 years? And I said, look, here's my biggest problem. Is that I teach you how to make money, lots of money, but what I can't seem to teach you that somewhere along the line that should be enough. Is $10,000 enough that you could just be happy? Is $20,000 a month enough? Is $50,000 a month enough? Is $100,000 a month enough? And the guy goes, Dell, how do you do nothing? I said, I do nothing because I'm not concentrating on making more money. See, when you're self-employed and you work hard, you have to work for there to be money. If you own a business, most people don't really own a business. They own a job. And so what that means is, well, I had it explained to me really well one day. I think it was at a case study. A guy came up to me and said, I've got a turnkey business. I said, really? What is that? He goes, if I go to work and turn the key, there's business. <laughs> <laughs> I go, that's pretty good. I like that. And then my comeback to that is always this. I have no keys. How do I have no keys? You realize if there wasn't somebody here to let me in, I couldn't get in Lifestyles. I don't have a key. In fact, since I stopped coming years ago, they actually put alarms and codes on the doors. Now, there's an alarm on there, isn't there? And there's card keys. I don't even have one of those. I used to have a key, but the key doesn't work anymore. 
And the card key, I never got one. Right? So I don't have a job. I've never been to my apartments except to buy them. We closed on them. We went there. We inspected them. We said, hi, how you doing? Great. Okay, send me the checks. Send me the money. They go, well, man, don't you want to go over there and just watch and be involved and get all in it? I go, I know that's what you want to do because you don't feel like you deserve money unless you go get in it. I don't want to be in it. There's only two types of people in the world. Those willing to work and those willing to let them. It takes both. I'm happy to be on the other side of that line now. I used to be one of those you got to work kind of guys. But it took a long time to get it into my head. You don't have to work to make money. So what happens is you eventually realize that the world for successful people, successful people are interdependent. Now, you can't be dependent and interdependent. It doesn't work. Either you're dependent, right, or you're free, you're independent. But to be interdependent, you have to have a group of people putting their efforts together, pooling their knowledge, their credit, their money, their resources, pooling them so that no one person has to work their butt off to get rich. We call these things, believe it or not, we call them a business. And guess what in business? We're climbing the ladder of how much wealth we have also. But there's a few things you need to understand about a business. If I'm not using my own credit, I'm not using my own money, and I'm not using my own knowledge, what are my limitations? What if I'm not using my time? I should have left that one. Thank you for putting that one in there. If I'm not using my own time, I'm not managing it, right? I have somebody smarter than me managing it. I'm borrowing 80% of the money from the bank and 20% of the money from investors. I'm not using my money. And the credit is non-recourse. I don't even have to sign for the loan. The business signs for the loan. What's the limitation? Absolutely none. One of our consultants here, Curtis Haynes, I don't think he's here tonight. Is Curtis here tonight? No. Curtis, every time I talk to him, owns another apartment complex or two or three. He's currently up to, I believe, and I'm, I'm just making up a number, 60-some apartment complexes, and he owns like 13,000 units. And the only thing I'd say to him is, Curtis, why? He just can't stop. But that's okay. That's what he wants to do. But the point I'm making to you is, there's no limitation. Nothing can stop him. The more money you make as you do this and you create passive income for yourself, the more money you make, what are you going to do with all that money? Oh, well, Dell, I know a lot of things I could do with my money. People tell me that all the time. I'll take your money, Dell, if you don't know what to do with it. You'd lose my money. <laughs> do you understand that? If I gave it to you, you'd lose it. Because if you don't know how to make it, you don't know how to conserve it, you don't know how to keep it, you lose it. But the reality is, somewhere along the line, pick your number. How large a house do you want to live in? What would make you happy? Are you good with a million-dollar home? Is a two-million-dollar home good enough? Five-million-dollar home? The girl I'm getting married to made me leave my million-dollar home in the Galleria because I had, had other girlfriends' DNA in that building. <laughs> she goes, and besides that, if another girl lived in this house with you, I got to have one bigger. So she went out and got me a 16,000 square foot home with a 20 car garage. And the only reason I bought it was because it was worth 5 million bucks and I screwed the guy down to 2.4. I said it was an investment. She said it was clean DNA. So what happens when you get here? What happens is, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to come back to you, and I'm going to say, hey, I want you to come back here, and I want you to give back. We're sharing 29 years' worth of knowledge on how to become wealthy, right? 29 years' worth of secrets, if there was such a thing, which there isn't. 
but very, very good knowledge. And you're getting it all at once so that you can use it effectively right out of the blocks. It's such good knowledge that for the last 12 years in a row, every single year, one of the Lifestyles members has won the National Apartment Association's Real Estate Investor of the Year. Now think about it, there's 44,000 independent apartment owners in the National Apartment Association. That's people like us that own, not big companies, but us. 44,000 of them, and one of our members wins every year for 12 years in a row. But wait, we won again this year. We're now at 13. You know, when you were a kid, you were told that you needed to make commitments. Here was a commitment. I commit to take this test on my own. I'm not going to look on somebody else's page. I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to figure it all out myself. I'm going to do it myself. And what that commitment has done has created in you a worthless commitment to yourself that you tell yourself every day, if I don't invent the way I get rich, if I don't make it my way, if it isn't something I thought up, then I don't get any enjoyment from it at all. I've got to do it my way, right? And what I'm saying to you is, boy, that was the dumbest thing they ever taught you in school, to not cheat. Every time somebody does something great here at Lifestyles, you know what I do? I go copy it. And then I bring it back and teach it to you guys so you don't have to figure it out. Does that make sense? In 29 years of copying everything that has worked and figured out everything that you figured out doesn't work because you've tried them all. Now we can tell you what to do. And so you're going to be able to take that knowledge and become independent, eventually interdependent. But watch out. Mark my words. I'm coming for you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you to do a case study or two. I'm going to get you to do road trips where we take people out and show them your stuff. Yeah, we're going to your place to see it. And then one day, you'll get that little phone call. Uh, yeah, I see that you're really, really successful, got a lot of money, and really don't need to work anymore. Would you please come back and teach and be a mentor? Can you imagine... For those of you who are guests, think about this. What good are teachers? You're a young guy. What good are teachers? You go to school, you got a teacher. Some of you in here are teachers, so I don't mean to insult any of you. If you know how to do ABCs and you can teach ABCs, that's cool. But who teaches you how to be a millionaire? It's got to be a millionaire. Does that make sense? You can't have somebody who doesn't know how to do it. I wrote a book on it. I read a book on it. Now I'm going to teach you what I read. That doesn't work. But how do you get millionaires to teach? First of all, most people don't want to give away their secrets. That's the first problem. Second problem is once you're rich and retired, you really don't want to go back to having a job. Right? So the way I get them to do it is I shame you into it. <laughs> I tell you, if you don't do it, you really are not giving back to what you should have given back for the fact that you're now that rich person sitting out here tonight laughing at all this because you're going, yeah, I remember the first day I ever came here, I sat in that chair right there and I didn't believe a thing anybody said. And of course, I thought you were an obnoxious asshole, which was right. But at the same token, I saw those people that got up here tonight and shared and said, if those people can do it, I can do it too. That's what you're here tonight for so that someday you'll have enough to give back. I tell people all the time, you want to commit to something, commit to having enough that you can give it away. There's a commitment. You're poor until you have enough to give away. Does that make sense? You're poor until you have enough to give away. Because as long as you don't have enough to give away, you're still groveling. You're still wanting more. You're demanding that you put the chips on your side of the table in life. 
we had some people in a meeting today, and they were complaining about property tax. Oh, my God, my property tax has gone up. I go, look, dude, let me explain this to you. I live in a $5 million home, and I pay taxes on a $5 million home. I have no kids that go to your school. We've never had domestic abuse. I've never had the cops to my house, never had the fire department in my house. You own a $5 million apartment complex. You've got 200 kids living in that thing that are going to school and burn the fucker down every single day. <laughs> and you are using up all of the resources this city has to get rich being an apartment owner. And what you want to do is complain about paying property taxes. Isn't that a little short-sighted? Because you need that fire department. You need those policemen. Does that make sense? So again, I leave you with this. If you don't have enough to give away, you're still poor. One last question. How many people here paid more than 400000 in taxes last year? Then I want to let you all know this. Even though real estate, done correctly, can earn you tax-free income or tax-deferred income, however you want to look at it, I want you to realize this. If you didn't pay 400000 in taxes last year, you don't have a tax problem. You have an income problem. And when you make that first million and you owe that 40%, $400,000, I bet you'd be darn happy to write that check so you can make the next million. Unfortunately, what you don't understand is we don't have to pay the 400000 because real estate, done correctly, will be tax-free. Hope you enjoy tonight. Have a good time.